um, this is a dog with pneumonia and even I could uh, diagnose this. This is, is uh, blastomycosis. Uh, I say even I, one of the problems with academia is I don't do my own radiographs, so I don't interpret my own radiographs. So I, I just send an animal down and they give me interpretation, but even I would know blastomycosis. Uh, and uh, nowadays it would be just straight itraconazole is how we would uh, start this. If it was life-threatening, really bad, I might simultaneously <coughs> start with uh, amphotericin. Uh, amphotericin has the more rapid onset, but uh, typically itraconazole. Now something else to bear in mind, uh, again with rapid kill-off, and it occurs mostly with amphotericin, but it can occur with itraconazole, and these really, really bad ones, rapid kill-off, may cause septic shock. Um, you know endotoxemia as the most common septic shock, but gram-positive and fungi also release into, uh, toxins when they die. Uh, so on some occasions we have to use steroids simultaneously with the antifungal uh, to address the rapid dial. Now we'd rather not do that because the fungi are held in, intact by cell-mediated immunity and uh, so if you just use steroids alone, you'd make this worse. But with the antifungal on board, sometimes we'll add a, a steroid if they're showing signs of sepsis. Uh, this is a dog with histoplasmosis. Nothing to really to comment. We would again use itraconazole. The point to make here is that while with blasto, the lung is the primary target, histo has a pretty high incidence of gastrointestinal involvement. So sometimes if it's in the pyloric uh, region, uh, gastropyloric region, we really can't use oral products initially because of decreased transit. So there we'll go back to the injectable. <coughs> now they make an injectable itraconazole, but historically we feel best with the amphotericin. So we'll start them on amphotericin and get the histo uh, uh, to shrink down where their GI tract becomes functioning again and then we'll switch them over to uh, itraconazole at that point. Uh, this is a uh, colonic resection, so uh, intestinal resection and anastomosis. And <coughs> here you can see amoxicillin and sofoxetin. All right, now, this is one which I hope that they were discontinuing the amoxicillin because you don't need both. Okay, one or the other. The big thing with intestinal resections and particularly with large bowel resections is uh, you've got to have four quadrant coverage because you've got a lot of anaerobes in there as well. Everyone always thinks E. coli when we think intestine but actually they're like a thousand obligate anaerobes to every facultative anaerobe in the GI tract in the colon. So uh, both of these are going to get uh, the anaerobes pretty well, uh, <coughs> but sofoxetin is going to have your better gram-negative spectrum against E. coli. So the sofoxetin injection uh, is our second generation cephalosporin, the only cephalosporin with good anaerobic activity, and it would be the, the better choice of the two. Uh, <coughs> I don't know if you can see, but this dog uh, has pretty severe muscle wasting. Uh, muscle atrophy, this has been going on a while, and has hepatozoonosis. So this is a protozoal disease, again, hepatozoonosis. You can sometimes diagnose it, uh, you can find the morula in the white cells, but largely we send off the PCR now. Uh, we used to do muscle biopsies, but this is the combination product. You're going to have clindamycin, pyrimethamine, and somewhere in here there's the trimethoprim sulfa as well. Now why it's on doxycycline, uh, I suspect they were concerned about rickettsial diseases. There wouldn't be a reason to add it uh, just from the standpoint of hepatozoonosis. Uh, after uh, the animal was sent home, it went on decox. Again, they're really prone to relapse uh, from uh, uh, hepatozoonosis if you don't put them on decox lifelong. 
this is uh, what not to do. Uh, this is a dog that uh, you can read here. It was tested negative for tick titers, which mostly we're talking about rickettsia. And had gone a course of doxycycline, but couldn't handle it, so he put them on enrofloxacin. Okay. Uh, <coughs> now, enrofloxacin will work if it is Rocky Mountain spotted fever, <coughs> but not for uh, ehrlichiosis. And the problem for this dog is thrombocytopenia. Uh, this dog actually had immune mediated thrombocytopenia. Okay. So uh, <coughs> um, the point I want to make here is the dog came in on Batril and the resident decided to continue the Batril because he didn't want it to have only one dose of Batril. All right, now here's where someone's taking a guideline and applying it without understanding why they're applying it. One of the things that is true is once you begin a course of antibiotics, you don't want to start pre stop prematurely before you get a cure. If you do so, then the organism survives and likely will be resistant to whatever, to that drug you were using. So you hear it on the news, you know, talking about how to take your antibiotics, always complete the course. If we had had something we were treating, then her actions would have been appropriate. But <coughs> all she was doing in this particular case, since it was not a, a rickettsial infection, it was not a bacterial infection, was treating the commensal flora and exposing them unneededly to antibiotic. So if there's not an active infection, uh, just because you started it doesn't mean that you continue it, uh, only if you were treating the active infection. Nasal aspergillosis. We definitely have enough nose to treat here. Um, this um, is a little unusual because this being in Collie, we more commonly see nasal aspergillosis in German Shepherds. Again, we don't know why there's a breed predilection, but there is. And though you could try voriconazole now, uh, the topical treatment is fairly effective. Again, you anesthetize the animal, uh, intubate it, pack off the uh, endotracheal tube, block the soft palate at the rear with a balloon Foley catheter, and then infuse uh, either enalconazole or clotrim, uh, clotrimazole into the nasal passages and sinuses, uh, occluding it where it won't get out, and then um, keep them there for an hour. And every 15 minutes, you rotate them 90 degrees to try to bathe those sinuses and nasal passages in the antifungal. And it's amazingly effective. All right, uh, this is a little dog that, uh, as a professor of mine used to say, is a plethora of pathology. Um, he has a lot of uh, problems going on. Uh, we could talk about this case for most of the hour if we wanted to uh, out of antibiotics, but he has a pulmonary thromboembolism. He's lucky to be alive in that respect. Pneumocystis coli. Uh, means that there is gas in the intestinal lining. Can be a normal finding, but usually implies some sort of um, enteritis. Uh, chronic bronchopneumonia in skin, as well as KCS and a uveitis. All right. uh, he's on for the bronchitis, clindamycin, and marbifloxacin. Okay. Uh, which is certainly appropriate pending culture and sensitivity. Uh, he may be on the metronidazole for the pneumocystis coli, cons uh, concerned about an anaerobe. But the point I wanted to make here is because he's on, uh, uh, he has chronic bronchitis, he's on theophylline as a bronchodilator. And remember the drug interaction that um, fluoroquinolones are enzyme inhibitors to theophylline and they correctly cut the dose of theophylline back here. If you don't cut it back, then you're likely to develop a theophylline toxicity um, in, uh, in a few uh, doses. Uh, this is a Russian black terrier. I didn't know such things existed. 
but he had a hydronephrosis uh, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever and a UTI, and he's post nephrectomy. All right. Now here we get into a little bit of uh, cases involving MIC result. And you can see he's on Clavamox here for staph, UTI, uh, as well as enrofloxacin. All right. So I've kind of color coded these, uh, the red or pink indicating resistance, the green indicating what was chosen, and the yellow indicating what might have been chosen instead. Um, <coughs> actually, a, a couple of points to make. Clavamox was chosen. It could have been anything in uh, the beta-lactam family. You can see basically all of them are susceptible. <coughs> and really, uh, either enrofloxacin or a beta-lactam would have been sufficient. There's really no real advantage to go into the combo. They're not synergistic. The uh, only rational reason to combine them was if you thought there was something else out there that you missed on culture. So if you were concerned about a coexisting infection besides the staff that was cultured, then yes, you could certainly combine things. But probably enrofloxacin as a sole agent or even clavamox as a sole agent would have been fine. Okay. Um, okay, this is Boudreaux. Uh, I'm going to spend a couple of slides talking about Boudreaux. He's relatively recent. He just went home uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and Boudreaux is a um, pit bull, and not mentioned here, but he actually was rescued from one owner to these new owners, uh, had him for about a year. And he was in a dog fight, and there were two dogs on one, and he came out on the losing end of this. Okay. So they took him to their local vet, and the vet put him on uh, Cephalex and, and Tramadol. Uh, over the course of the week, he stopped eating, uh, started vomiting, and the owner noticed the skin on the medial aspect of the left back leg was black. Uh, took him to a vet in Tuscaloosa who referred him on. Um, <clears throat> and uh, upon arrival, he was put on unison and uh, enrofloxacin. Now, uh, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, you haven't had analgesics, but I don't think tramadol was a very good choice in this particular dog. Tramadol's efficacy in dogs is debatable. Uh, you'll get to this, but tramadol requires conversion to an active metabolite, and dogs do it very, very little. So there's some controversy as to how effective tramadol is. So that wasn't a good choice. Uh, the other thing, though, is you can see what's happened. Uh, this was when he came in. This is the rear leg. You can see this totally sloughed here. This is the shoulder and chest. You can see sloughed areas here. So basically, we're dealing with uh, types of gangrene, uh, more or less, in this uh, particular dog. So uh, the uh, second day, he was amazingly stable, considering he was so septic. Uh, so they didn't have to uh, get as aggressive as I might have normally. You'd think with that sort of uh, dead tissue, you'd want to go for a big gun, and if I thought he were dying of the infection, then yes, I would have gone to something like a carbapenem or aminoglycoside combination. But to start off, because he was relatively stable, uh, the unison uh, vitrol was a pretty good combination. And I'll, I'll uh, make a point uh, right here. They, they, they went ahead and amputated his left leg uh, they didn't think they could save that. Now, they didn't have a choice. You can see here how they've opened up and debrided all of uh, this chest tissue. Okay, so his head is up here, his back is, is down here. Uh, this brings up a point about um, chronic wound management. Uh, there's no way they were going to be able to close this, okay? Because you can see they've already debrided it uh, in surgery, but all of this is fibrin and necrosis. 
this is going to be an ongoing wound management thing. And these loops of suture right here are uh, tie points for what's called a tie-over bandage. So they'll uh, <coughs> use wet to dry bandaging over this wound and they'll tie it across these different suture points to hold it intact against his chest. And then on a daily basis, those bandages are removed. This dead tissue is uh, surgically um, dissected off. Oftentimes it actually just pulls off with pressure. Uh, the wound would be lavaged again uh, and then uh, bandaged uh, for the next day. The problem you run into, and this is why I wanted to mention I wouldn't have gone to meropenem or aminoglycoside because whatever you start with in an open wound like this, you're going to see resistance move in. All right, so you don't start with your ultimate best antibiotic if you can avoid it. Okay, so uh, this was on the second day. Uh, this progressed. They still had not gotten their culture and sensitivity back. I don't know what the problem was. Day six, they partially closed the chest wound, so they'd gotten most of the dead tissue out. Um, have you had first, second, and third intention healing? Okay, so this is a third intention, uh, but not closing it all together. They wanted uh, uh, drainage to occur. All right, <coughs> uh, about the time after they did that uh, third intention, they started seeing breakthrough abscessation. So uh, drainage was coming from the amputation site and uh, through the chest. And here, are the results of the culture and sensitivity taking the sample during surgery, okay? And not surprisingly, uh, it's resistant to clavamox and it's resistant to enrofloxacin, all right? Uh, <coughs> also notice it's susceptible, uh, was resistant to cephalophen. <laughs> Uh, that goes back to the second thing that the veterinarian could have done better at the referring. Remember I said that wounds, especially dog on dog, are four quadrant coverage re uh, requirements. All right. Cephalexin was what the an antibiotic he picked. That'll go for your staph and your strep, but it doesn't get your anaerobes reliably. So uh, unison or clavamox would have been better choices, different things, but cephalophen was not the best choice to begin with. And it was uh, resistant as was, we turned out, remember I said I'm seeing a lot more resistance now to the fluoroquinolones. And uh, probably uh, this is why uh, we have some progression despite antibiotics. So we looked at what was uh, possible, and we've got an E. coli, we've got a Karani bacteria, and we've got an Enterococcus. Uh, again, the, the Enterococcus, normally I don't put a lot of weight on an Enterococcus in a wound. Now this one, maybe. This is so severe, there was so much tissue damage, uh, perhaps I'm a little more concerned about it. Um, treating the Karani bacteria is uh, not particularly an issue. A lot of things were susceptible. It's mostly going after the uh, E. coli. And here we see three choices where we have a susceptible on both the E. coli and if we want it, also the other two organisms. All right. So we could have chosen chloramphenicol, doxy, or imipenem. Now, imipenem, again, we'd rather not use if we can avoid it. Every time in this, when I, I say that we're using it, uh, a carbapenem, I kind of shudder because that's the last resort, and any time I'm using lenizolid or vancomycin, I kind of shudder because that's the last resort. So we're going to hold off here. Arguably, we could have gone with either doxy or chloramphenicol. Uh, we opted, uh, Dr. Swanson talked with me about this, and we opted to go to chloramphenicol. Uh, it has a better reputation for a, a lot of serious infections and really good uh, tissue penetration, but either one would have been uh, perhaps acceptable. Uh, <coughs> um, uh, and the animal did respond, all right. 
the amount of exudate decreased tremendously after starting the chloramphenicol, and we thought we were doing pretty good. And then around day 21, uh, we started to see exudate again. So they recultured. Uh, they recultured on day 19. So this is the results on day 21. And we have again got an E. coli and an Aerococcus, but <coughs> what you can't uh, appreciate right there is if you start looking at the susceptibility profile, we've got resistance uh, in uh, TMS, ticrocillin, and other drugs, the, these, the cephalosporins, that were not there from the prior E. coli. So uh, since we haven't been using those drugs on this particular dog, there's a good chance that this is a secondary E. coli that's moved in uh, from the hospital due to the open wound. And this is not uncommon. Uh, open wounds in hospital environments, infections from hospitals are called nosocomial infections and uh, they often are multi-resistant. Really, if you've got a serious infection, especially a wound, the hospital is one of the worst places you can be uh, because the things that move in tend to be multi-drug resistant. And we didn't have a lot of choices here. The uh, ones here, uh, we could have used an aminoglycoside, but again, we'd rather avoid it if we uh, could. Um, Sofoxetin, perhaps, genomycin, perhaps, but uh, all of these are injectable and we're hoping to send this dog home, so they chose doxycycline. Um, and actually, that was my recommendation. Um, we have a tendency sometimes, and, and even I'm a little guilty of this, is we want to use the new drugs. And that's true in uh, unknown situations in empiric therapy because there tends to be resistance to new drugs, to old drugs. But if you have a susceptibility, there's no reason you can't use an older drug. And that's exactly what they did. And that was uh, appropriate here to use the doxycycline. Now, I'll show you a case later on that they made some vancomycin gel and they had some left over so they infused the vancomycin gel into uh, this pocket here, okay? And that, of course, is aimed at staph and enterococcus. I'm not overly concerned about it, but it was certainly a, uh, fine to go ahead and infuse it. The gel is called a palaxomer gel. It's basically a sustained release uh, formulation, in this case, to release vancomycin. But mostly it was the doxycycline. Uh, so uh, Boudreaux was finally discharged on the 24th day. Uh, he was sent home on chloramphenicol and doxycycline. This is actually a day or two before he was sent home, but you can see we've got a complete third intention closure. Uh, and everything was, looked really good uh, when they sent him home. Uh, of course, he had a $10,500 bill, all right? <laughs> which is, I shouldn't laugh because uh, the, uh, the owners didn't even have him on heartworm preventative. He was heartworm positive. Uh, so uh, that they, they had skimped money to avoid heartworm preventative and, and he hadn't had any vaccinations except from the co-op. Uh, but yet they'd spend $10,000 on him and they did pay their bill evidently. Okay. So, uh, in open wounds, it's not uncommon to have to do multiple cultures uh, because you have the secondary invaders uh, coming in. And particularly, it wasn't involved here, but Pseudomonas in particular can be develop resistance during the course of treatment. So when you have a Pseudomonas, sometimes you have to reculture as well. So Bidro was a good outcome, but very expensive. Okay, a few cases uh, uh, without any pictures of the animals, unfortunately. These are just ones that uh, a clinician consulted with me on. This is a, um, a dog with the discospondylitis due to an E. coli. 
And again, discospondylitis is one of those that I really dislike. It's basically an osteomyelitis of the vertebra, but it's uh, very hard to uh, treat. Um, you have limitations in terms of um, going in and curataging and that sort of thing because of its <laughs> location. And you can see uh, virtually everything is resistant except aminoglycoside and carbapenem. And because osteomyelitis has to be treated for so long, typically weeks, four or six weeks is not uncommon, they opted to use uh, carbapenem. Now, imipenem, again, uh, it doesn't lend itself to extra label outpatient use because it has to be dissolved in 100 mils of fluid, and that doesn't uh, uh, make it easy to dose. But meropenem does dissolve in 10 mils, a bottle in about 10 mils or so. So you can do that, and that's what they did. They sent this dog, uh, initially treated it, and then sent it home on outpatient meropenem. Not what I want to see, but we didn't have a lot of choices, and that's becoming more and more the case. <coughs> this is a wound infection, and we have an enterobacter, right here is number one, then two enterococci, now here's the important, and we've got two obligate anaerobes. So they did a good job in making sure they submitted anaerobic culture and susceptibility. <coughs> and based on the aerobes, the E. coli and, and the two enterobacter, uh, here are some, some possibilities. Now, uh, if you wanted to, you could put them on a carbapenem and get everything, but again, I'd rather not. Uh, clinicians don't want to use the um, am aminoglycosides if they can stay away. So uh, really probably marbofloxacin and ampicillin uh, were the best combination here. All right. Now I'm making a point by drawing this line. I'm using the ampicillin really more for the anaerobes than I am the enterococci. Again, I'm not overly concerned about the enterococci, but I am concerned about uh, growing two anaerobes. So <coughs> the, the ampicillin, and probably would use oral uh, amoxicillin uh, in this particular case for outpatient. So that would be the, the normal combo. Uh, you could have treated with clavamox, but there's no real need to. Uh, the, um, for the, at least the anaerobes are not prone to produce beta-lactamase, so there's no real reason to spend the extra money on clavamox if regular amoxicillin or um, ampicillin will work. Okay. Um, this is a UTI and prostatitis in a dog due to an E. coli, and I want to point out here this is the culture and susceptibility for the urine panel. Now, urine panels, they use higher breakpoints than they do for uh, other infections, all right, because these drugs concentrate in the urine. And <coughs> my uh, disclaimer there is the prostate infection doesn't uh, achieve the concentrations there that you do in urine. So, it's appropriate for us to, this is great in terms of treating the UTI, we can pick anything, but we really want to see if the breakpoints match up for the regular MIC panel in terms of treating the prostatitis. And here you've got to have things that cross into the urine, or into the prostate, cross the blood prostate barrier. So that's going to be TMS, chloramphenicol, fluoroquinolones for uh, multi um, gram positive and gram negative. And yes, we could have used TMS, yes, we could have used chloramphenicol, but most people kind of default to the fluoroquinolones. So uh, either enrofloxacin or marbrofloxacin would be appropriate there. Uh, this is a dog that had a TICA, uh, total ear canal ablation and vent uh, ventral bullous osteotomy in short, chronic otitis that had moved into the middle ear, and it grew a pseudomonas. So again, we try to avoid the aminoglycosides, 
Timentin would be a possibility uh, as an injectable. Carbapenem also a possibility as an injectable, but we do have orals here, uh, so enrofloxacin would be uh, appropriate. Now, had this tested resistant on enrofloxacin, remember on Pseudomonas that it can be susceptible to marbofloxacin or ciprofloxacin. So I, uh, if they didn't test it, and this now we do, uh, this was an earlier CNS, uh, I would ask them to test for marbofloxacin in this if had, had it been resistant to enrofloxacin. Uh, this is a chronic bronchitis, okay, uh, E. coli, pseudomonas, and staph. And you can see we have a lot of resistance problems. Uh, see how much is pink. Things just to get the pseudomonas, we could have considered timentin, but it missed the E. coli. Um, so we either have to go with a carbapenem or an aminoglycoside clavulanic acid combination. This would have been my choice uh, to go amicacin to get the uh, E. coli and pseudomonas and add the clavamox to get the staph. Um, I can't remember, I suspect they went with the carbapenem again, which I would rather they not have done, uh, but it does provide um, a great coverage uh, and reasonable cost without the risk of the uh, nephrotoxicity. What yeah. What NI for? Oh, good question. All right. Um, NI means no interpretive criteria. Um, <coughs> the, um, these breakpoints are set by an organization called CLSI, uh, Clinical Laboratory Standards Institute. And largely, they look at drug-bug combinations. And so a lot of these, the bacteria have had no established breakpoint set by the organization. So that means there's no criteria for the lab to assign an SI or R2. Now what I do in those cases is I look at the MIC value if they gave me one, okay? And if uh, it's a less than or equal to, that means it tested susceptible at the lowest concentration. So if I, I generally avoid the NIs, but if I uh, don't have anything else that fits, I'll look at an NI, and, and if it's at one of those less than or equal to's, I might consider using it. Um, <coughs> It also brings out a point of what do, do the numbers on an MIC mean. And obviously I already said less than or equal to it's at the lowest concentration. So that means it, it, it's pretty susceptible. Greater than it, it tested resistant at the highest concentration. What about an actual number with nothing in front of it? Uh, that doesn't mean a lot to you, truthfully. Uh, the, um, the potency on these things is different, so you can't say a, t a two microgram per mil of drug X is better than an eight microgram per mil of drug B. It doesn't work that way. You have to look at the continuum of, of the concentrations produced, which you don't typically know. So I do look at less than or equal to and greater than or equal to, but other than that, I have to hit the literature. Okay. Um, so this is a urine pseudomonas, and on the urine panel, everything's resistant, so we have to ask for something else. And the things that were susceptible, uh, amicacin, that would be a, an option. We're running out of options. Spectinomycin is S. One, it's really hard to find the injectable, and two, I'm a little leery Again, I mentioned pseudomonas is prone to develop resistance in the course of therapy. And spectinomycin is one that's not normally effective on pseudomonas. So though it shows S, I'd be a little reluctant to trust it. Luckily, uh, ciprofloxacin was susceptible. And <coughs> I don't trust cipro yet in dogs and cats for most infections because of the erratic absorption I mentioned 
But in a UTI, there's enough leeway with concentration, I would consider using ciprofloxacin uh, orally. Uh, I would rather probably use um, marbofloxacin, though. All right, this is a, a urine uh, UTI for a staff, and <laughs> pretty well everything is resistant. Uh, or at least 99%, 95%. And uh, by the way, sometimes you'll see these without numbers up here. And uh, whenever it's oxacillin resistant and it's a staph, that means it's a MRSA or a MRSI. So automatically all your beta-lactams are considered resistant. So if you ever get a staph that is it, all the beta lactams are shown resistant without an actual number out to the side of them, then that's probably because it's methicillin. Okay, so we could use uh, an aminoglycoside, which I have done. Uh, uh, worst case, rifampin is sensitive, but as a monotherapy, I wouldn't use it. Uh, which leaves us, though. Remember, I said nitrofurin toin. When you've got these multi-resistant UTIs, if they don't otherwise test it, ask them to run nitrofurin toin. And in this particular case, it was susceptible, and that's what was used. It's a good thing, too. All right, and lastly, um, Rex. Hopefully you won't see dogs like Rex. Uh, not that there was anything wrong with Rex as a dog, uh, but because of his infection. He had had a TPLO and femur repaired in 2015. The plates were still in. And evidently this whole time he had had a draining tract coming off his back leg back here that they'd never uh, resolved. And uh, so he had an ongoing osteomyelitis. They went in and removed the plate. And this is not good. Uh, you can see the only thing, well, everything is resistant. Chloramphenicol is intermediate, but I can tell you, you'd never be able to treat the, um, at 16 micrograms per mil with chloramphenicol. Uh, there'd be too many side effects. So we don't have anything on the common antimicrobial tested. So what they did in Rex's case is they started him on linizolid. Luckily, the price has come down where it's I think Dr. Butler was getting it for $9 a capsule or tablet, which is a lot better than $60 that it used to be. Uh, and this is where they made up the original vancomycin uh, gel for sustained release. So when they were in there removing the plate, they coated that area in the vancomycin gel. This has to be compounded. Uh, you can't buy it commercially. Uh, so the pharmacy made up a, a sustained release vancomycin gel that they applied during surgery, and then he went home on oral linozolid. Uh, but this makes me really, really scared. Uh, uh, this is not what we want to get out into ICU. We had him uh, more or less in isolation gloves, uh, gowns, foot baths, everything we could uh, to avoid this. Okay, So I think that's it before I uh, cut it off. Any questions? Again, no specific points except just little, hopefully, tidbits of stuff you, you uh, picked up on. All right, then. Have a good rest of the day.